everyone knows that to do well on your MarCP exam, you need to have good medical knowledge. But as important and equally overlooked is how you approach the MRCP questions. Now, this is what I'm going to go over in this video. Um, watch till the end and we'll go through five questions together stressing the importance of how you approach the questions we'll go over how to have the right clinical decision making how to identify what the question is really asking for to understand what the question is specifically asking um, using clinical ex reasoning for elimination and using educated guessing when needed when you're down to a few options and um, and you don't know which one to pick now, um, let's get into it um, with our first um, question. Now, first question our 76 year old man comes to the clinic with his wife. Um, over the last three to four months, um, she has noted him becoming more unsteady on his feet and some short term memory loss, right? So there's, there's unsteadiness and there's loss of short term memory. It's two occasions where he couldn't find his way home, five occasions where he was incontinent of urine. Blood pressure is a bit high. There's a bit of a postural drop. Heart rate is okay. Um, the rest of the examination is fine. All the reflexes are brisk, and there's an obvious gait apraxia. Right. So we have a triad, triad of um, you have a triad of um, of memory impairment. Um, there's imbalance, um, and there's urinary incontinence. Right. There's a CT scan, which which is even more uh, pointing to the diagnosis, where there is a ventricular enlargement um, and the opening pressure is 21 on a on a lumbar puncture which is normal so this is all um, pointing towards a normal pressure hydrocephalus now so we have the diagnosis but again look at what the question is asking for what's the most appropriate initial intervention right so normal pressure hydrocephalus looking at these choices um, prednisolone would not be of any benefit in all pressure hydrocephalus. Bendroflumothiazide is a thiazide diuretic that doesn't do much. Um, acetazolamide and shunt insertion are both possible treatments, right? Um, you need to get rid of that excess um, CSF fluid. So the shunt insertion is the main treatment. Acetazolamide, um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor can be an adjunctive therapy. Now, the treatment is a shunt insertion. Is that what we go for? Now, this is why I handpicked this question because Look at what the question is asking for. What's the most appropriate initial intervention? Now, we have our, tr our triad and, it's, and, our, C and a, our CT finding. It's pointing towards the, the, the diagnosis. But to confirm the diagnosis, we need to do a therapeutic tap, right? We do a therapeutic lumbar puncture, get some CSF out, around 30 to 70 moles of, of CSF, and see if that improves the symptoms. And if it does, then we know that getting rid of some CSF is going to be useful, and we can then think of a shunt insertion. So the most appropriate initial intervention here is a therapeutic lumbar puncture. Again, it's very important to miss this. You know, sh you, you, normal pressure hydrocephalus, think, oh yeah, I know this, shunt insertion is gonna, is gonna solve the problem when you choose it, but that's not what the question is asking for. So again, a good example of reading um, the question and knowing what it's asking for. Um, question number two, we've got a 64-year-old woman with a history of chronic renal failure related to type 1 diabetes presenting to the clinic for review. Um, the GFR is 20, and there's a rise in serum phosphate at 1.8 millimole per litre. Now, the question is asking, which of the following is the primary cause of the hyperphosphatemia? Now, this is a classic MRCP question. Now, you have chronic kidney disease, right? So with chronic kidney disease, your vitamin D levels drop because they're not activated in the kidney um, as well anymore. So look at choice D. Choice D is wrong. There's, increased hydro there's decreased hydroxylation of vitamin D and CKD. So you can cross off D. Now, vitamin D is low. So calcium absorption is low. So vitamin D is low. Calcium is low. Um, and that drives parathyroid up. Um, so it causes a secondary hyperparathyroidism. So that um, eliminates our choice C as well. Hypo hypoparathyroidism is also wrong. Um, now, our choice E, increased intake of dietary phosphate. There's no evidence for it in the stem. This lady, 64-year-old lady, why is she having too much, um, too much phosphate in diet? Right? So that that's, can be eliminated as well. Now, we're down to two choices. Now, what is the main cause of this hyperphosphatemia? 
Now, as we said, in CKD, um, vitamin D drops, so calcium drops, and parathyroid goes up. Now, th this could cause, um, and if parathyroid is high, it usually gets rid of, of, of phosphate. So we would expect phosphate levels to be low. But because the kidneys are the main excretors of, of, of phosphate, um, and because the kidneys are not working well, the phosphate accumulates in the body. So the primary cause of why the phosphate is, is, is high is because the kidneys are not working well, and that has caused a secondary hyperparathyroidism. So the root cause of all of this is a decreased functioning of renal tissue. So a correct choice is choice A. But just going through basic um, physiology, we were able to eliminate three choices straight away, and then knowing, doing some analysis and having that clinical decision making where you think logically and you think about the sequence of events um, leads us to the correct answer. Um, now, before I go on to the next question, um, I just want to mention MRCP updates shortly. These questions are all from MRCP updates. They're part of their past paper questions. Um, subscribe using the link below and you'll get a 10% discount. Um, there are thousands of past paper questions with elaborate explanations and an online textbook that's ideal for visual learners. I personally used MRCP updates in my part one and part two preparation. It's a great preparation resource and I do recommend using it three to six months um, before your exam. If you're unsure how to start your preparation, at the end of this video, I'll put two videos on the screen detailing what to do to start your preparation for part one and part two. All right, let's get back to the, to the questions. Um, question number three is a 73 year old woman is admitted to ED following a collapse at church. By the time she gets to the hospital, she's awake and conscious and tells you that she's been recently prescribed the course of antibiotics for a chest infection. Now, blood pressure is fine, um, heart rate is fine, examination is non-significant, an ECG shows short runs of VT, and, it, and we also see a uh, prolonged QT interval, right? QT at 520. So the question is, which of the following is likely the cause of her collapse? Now, this is a, you, you might think this is an you either know it or you don't question, right? What are the causes of QT prolongation? But even, the, I, I want to stress how you can eliminate answers, even if you don't know what causes, which antibiotic causes a QT prolongation. From those choices, you see that comoxiclav and flucloxacillin are both penicillin derivatives, right? So they can't both be right. Right. If it's a penicillin derivative causing a QT prolongation, the other classes should cause it as well. So they're both wrong because they can't both be right. Cephalexine is a ceph um, cephalosporine that's also very close to um, to um, to um, penicillins. So if if I didn't have a clue, I would eliminate cephalexin as well, um, just because its similarities would be would be would be close to other penicillin derivatives. So that would leave me with clarithromycin and doxycycline. And at this point, if I would have to make an educated guess, it's down to a 50-50, even if you don't um, know what's the right answer. Now, the right answer, of course, is clarithromycin, which is a uh, macrolide and, um, and it causes a QT prolongation. Um, common causes, um, just I'll list it here, of QT prolongation medications. You've got antipsychotic, haloperidol, cutiabine, Got your tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline. Um, even other SSRIs such as citalopram and acetalopram cause a QT prolongation. Um, antibiotics, um, you have um, the macrolide and also um, hydroxychloroquine also causes QT prolongation. Um, other medications, amiodarone, um, common medications, um, ondansetron also cause a QT prolongation in your clinical practice. Always make sure that you do an ECG, check for QT prolongation before, um, before prescribing um, on Dancitron for nausea and vomiting. Okay, um, moving on. Fourth question, 59-year-old woman with known mitral stenosis comes to cardiology. She's on a nitrate for shortness of breath, bisoprolol for her rate and exercise tolerance. Um, blood pressure is okay, heart rate is fine. She's an AF. She has a mallow flush and JVP is raised and there's some mild pitting edema to both of her ankles. So there's some um, peripheral overload and there's a mallow flush. Now the question is, which of the 
following as the strongest pointer towards worsening valve stenosis. So which of these are a marker of worsening um, mitral valve stenosis? Now, looking at these choices, an increased creatinine, you know, we think of the mitral valve, right? If the mitral valve is, is stenosed, it causes a pressure overload over the pulmonary system, right? So it wouldn't affect our, our systemic circulation. In aortic stenosis, if it gets really bad, it causes not enough blood to reach the other organs and it could cause a CKD. So I would cross off C because, again, that's a feature of aortic stenosis. Vague answers, such as increasing resting pulse rate or valve calcification. Now, they happen in, in mitral stenosis, but they also happen in other conditions. They're not a specific indicator for worsening MS. So I would cross off D and E for being to non-specific. Now that leaves me with complete heart blocker hemoptysis. Again, we're down to two choices. Now, hemoptysis is the correct answer because with a mitral stenosis, it causes a pulmonary hypertension because there's a pressure, there's a back pressure on the, on the pulmonary vasculature, and that causes um, a um, ve the venous, um, the pulmonary veins to be congested and causes alveolar hemorrhage and it's an indicator of really bad mitral stenosis. Right? A complete heart block you would get if there's a problem with the aorta, if there's an aortic dilatation. So you would can get it in aortic stenosis, where there is a there's a post um, stenotic dilatation of the aorta or an aortic regurg. You wouldn't expect it in in mitral problems. In mitral stenosis, what's the most common usually arrhythmia is, is atrial fibrillation that's in the question because usually the atria, the left atrium gets dilated and, and causes an atrial fibrillation. All right. Carrying on to our last question is an obese 28 year old woman comes to the clinic for a review. She's short of breath for the last six months or so. She's not able to catch the train. She gets breathless. Uh, no past medical history. She smokes five cigarettes a day no alcohol, um, blood pressure is a bit high, BMI is 33, so BMI is raised, the chest is clear, um, but air entry is diminished at both bases. There's no wheeze or crepitation and saturation is 94% on air. Now looking at these bloods, the um, renal function is okay, a full blood count is okay. See bicarbonate is elevated, there's a blood gas, PO2 is low, PCO2 is 6.8. Now we don't have a pH, but we have indicators of a of a respiratory acidosis with some compensation. Now this is not we can't say if it's a if it's a respiratory failure without the the, the pH, but um, we're getting a, a picture of a hypercapnic respiratory failure, right, or respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation. So of these um, choices, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis would cause a type 1 respiratory failure. Thromboembolic disease, again, would cause hypoxia, but there's no problem with, with, with ventilation in both of these. In, 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 in IPF, there isn't a, a constriction of, the, um, of airflow. Um, so C and E can both be eliminated. Um, asthma and COPD can also be both eliminated just from the question because there's no wheeze, there's no crepitation, the chest is clear. It's just reduced air sounds at the bases. Um, so asthma and COPD are out of the picture as well, and we're left with, um, with D, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, which makes sense in the context of the question as well, with a raised BMI and um, uh, with a diminished air entry to the, to the basis bilaterally. Okay, folks, that was all um, for our five questions. Um, I hope you found this useful. If you did, please like the video um, and subscribe to the channel. Um, I have a lot of these MRCP preparation videos. We also do a lot of medical education on the channel. So if you enjoyed it, um, please subscribe uh, for more content like this. All right, see you later.